Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for a briefing to discuss the findings and insights of the 2022 Sustainable Energy in America Factbook. I'm Dan Bursett, Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. EESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. We have also developed a program that provides technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. Our event today is sponsored by our friends at the Business Council for Sustainable Energy and hosted in coordination with the leadership and members of the House and Senate Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucuses. Many thanks to Senators Reed, Crapo, Van Hollen, and Collins, and Representative Kind for your support and assistance with our briefing today. Let me now take a moment to very briefly share some logistics. First, as with all EESI briefings, we will post an archive of the webcast along with the presentation materials to our website. If you miss anything or want to revisit any of the topics we're about to cover, please visit us, visit us online at www.eesi.org. And while you're there, please take a moment to sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. This newsletter is the best way to keep up with everything we do at EESI and ensure you receive the full range of policymaker education and technical assistance resources. And we have some really great briefings coming up in the next few weeks, including climate adaptation programs across agencies on March 18th, and building a durable national framework for large landscape conservation on March 29th. No one will want to miss those, so be sure to subscribe to Climate Change Solutions. And second, uh, after our second panel, our final panelist, we will transition to a discussion, and that means we will have time for questions from our online audience. If you have a question, please follow EESI on Twitter at EESI online and send in your questions that way. You're also welcome to send us an email, uh, and the email address to use is ask, A-S-K, at EESI.org. Now it is my pleasure to introduce the first of our speakers, Emily Duncan. Emily is Vice President of Government Relations and the head of the Washington, D.C. Office of National Grid an electric and national, natural gas utility with customers in Massachusetts, New York, and Rhode Island. Of special importance today, Emily chairs the board of directors of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, and she's a past president of the DC chapter of the Women's Energy Network. Emily, as always, it is great to see you. Please take it away. Great. Thanks so much, Dan. It's so wonderful to be here. Thank you for having us. I want to thank uh, EESI um, for their leadership in this space and for this great partnership we've had over these many years. Um, if you can believe it, it is the 10th year of the fact book, something that we are very excited about. And I think, as Dan said, there's um, no more important time for the fact book than today, right? I mean, what we have going on in Ukraine um, and with energy supply globally, uh, what we all are looking for is facts. And that's something that the fact book has always provided. And once again, this year, we have broken records as we do every year. And I know Lisa Jacobson is going to walk us through those. Um, so I'm really excited to turn it over to the president of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, Lisa Jacobson. Thanks so much, Emily. And yes, thanks to the entire EESI team. This is really the highlight of our outreach and we feel very privileged to be able to partner with EESI as well as the caucus. So with that, I'm going to get started and share some of the facts with you. Just give me a moment while I share my screen. So again, um, the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, for those participants that may not be familiar with the organization, we are a broad-based clean energy trade association. We are celebrating our 30th anniversary as a coalition, and we represent primarily commercially available clean energy and energy efficiency technologies, products, and services. Uh, we also have uh, members that span the entire supply chain, for the clean energy transition, you know, representing um, industrial manufacturers, uh, energy end users, public power, investor owned utilities, uh, energy and environmental service providers, and it, and it goes on. And in total, currently in the United States, these sectors represent over 3 million jobs. Uh, it's really a tremendous uh, growth in our employment and the prospects are, are very bright for the future for economic investment as well as job expansion. And I know we'll hear about some of those 
discussion points uh, in the industry panel that will follow my overview comments on the fact book. The Business Council's primary sector focus has been energy efficiency, natural gas, and renewable energy, but we are also very involved in a whole range of decarbonization technologies, and the fact book in some new areas is covering them in more detail. Things like renewable natural gas, hydrogen, carbon capture and storage and utilization, um, and many others. So I keep this slide up here for a few minutes just so everyone can take a look so you can get all the information that I'm gonna share with you today on the BCSE website, plus many more tools. We have an amazing video. We have a lot of graphics for social media. We have kind of mini dives into the, into the data set so you can find what you're looking for quickly. So if you were looking for information on fuel cells or combined heat and power, you could just go right into those sections and get to those data sets. So as Emily said, this is our 10th year producing the Sustainable Energy in America Factbook. And the Business Council for Sustainable Energy commissions it from an independent analytic firm, Bloomberg NEF. We've been on this road and seen many new developments. We've seen some you know, ups and downs uh, as we're deploying and using a more diverse energy mix. But you know, I think the last two years really were like no other. Um, so I'm gonna share with you kind of what we're thinking of as the three R's and I'll get to that in a moment. But I just wanted to highlight first all the sponsors that help make this project possible. And you'll hear from a few uh, representatives from these companies and associations today. So as I said, the three R's. First R is records. And we're really excited because even despite, you know, COVID conditions and a lot of challenges, the clean energy transition marched on and, and it was in full force and in many different sectors. I'm just gonna share some of the high points with you. First is investment. We saw record levels globally in energy transition investment. And this is you know, a methodology developed by Bloomberg NEF. So this is not even all the clean energy and energy efficiency investment globally. This is the selection that they chose. So here is a very strong, but subset of investment in clean energy. And on the left-hand side, you'll see where we track versus other countries. And we have remained in the United States second to China in this type of investment for a good number of years. But as you'll see, the overall total is record-breaking. And then when you look on the right-hand side, you can see where U.S. energy transition investment is going. And we also had a record-breaking year. And it primarily went into renewable energy, and electric transportation. Those were the, the biggest areas of investment in 2021. However, you know, you'll notice here, you'll see things like hydrogen and CCUS on the hydrogen front. We actually doubled our investment from 2020 to 2021, from 100 million to 200 million. So it's still, you know, not at the scale of renewable energy or uh, electric transportation, but it is growing fast and it is a big area for investor interest as well as public sector investment. In terms of other records, you know, renewable energy had a, another record breaking year in terms of deployment. You could see, you know, we topped 2020 with BNF's estimate of 37.3 gigawatts built. You'll see uh, when you look at the different color coding, it's primarily solar and wind represented in, in the yellow and blue, but we know we have many renewable energy technologies and some of them you know, are really not untapped to their potential. So don't forget uh, biomass, geothermal, waste to energy, uh, hydropower, of course, um, there's much more we can do, but in terms of what's being built, this gives you a very good snapshot of that landscape. One other thing I would note here, because it will come up later in some of the records when it relates to policy, is look at the trajectory. And especially when you look at solar, um, you, you'll see that when we have supportive federal policies, in particular tax policies that are long-term and th that signal the market, we deploy. And when we look back you know, over the last several years, kind of going back to 2013, 2014, 
when the investment tax credit received a long-term extension, you see that steady state growth in the yellow and, and solar benefited a great deal from that. So supportive policies that signal the market will help us deploy very effectively. Another record area has been in corporate procurement of clean energy. And we're right now gonna look at renewable energy procurement, which has primarily been uh, solar and wind, but uh, there's also activity in terms of clean, cleaning and greening up fleets. So in the transportation area, companies have been making big commitments there, as well as on energy efficiency. There are initiatives that focus on energy productivity and companies sign up for that. But another point I would make um, on the right-hand side here is yes, we see some of the usual suspects that were the market makers here in terms of technology companies, but this is really broadening well beyond just the tech sector. We picked out a few, so we have, you know, Target, we have McDonald's up here. You know, the list is, is very long and it grew in 2021, both globally in terms of the companies that signed on to renewable energy pledges, and also um, here in the United States, the companies that signed on to the renewable energy pledges, as well as pledges in energy productivity and in clean uh, and green fleets. Another area for records has been you know, energy storage. Um, and you see a dramatic uptick uh, in the past year for energy storage. So energy storage predominantly over 80% is through pumped hydropower systems. And you can see that represented in the blue on the left-hand side, but what's being built uh, more recently has related to battery storage. And so again, big uptick, and this is extremely important development as we integrate more renewable energy into the system. And also, you know, as we move to more electric vehicles. Another record has been in the area of natural gas. Um, you know, as we're going through this energy transition and we are becoming cleaner in terms of our energy mix and our power sector emissions are going down, we are also seeing increased demand across the economy for natural gas. So this, you know, presents uh, both an opportunity, in particular, when you look at really what put us over the mark in 2021, it was LNG exports. So if you look at that area in the red, you know, we had a record year for LNG exports. We also had, you know, large um, areas of interest, again, across all sectors. So power, uh, commercial, industrial. So natural gas is a key part of our economy. And, you know, I'm sure we'll hear in the discussion how the role of natural gas fits in, not just in this moment, this in intense time geopolitically, but also as we decarbonize. Um, you know, briefly, what you know, I think the the opportunity is how do we use the existing infrastructure the natural gas system provides provides us as the molecules decarbonize, just like we did for electricity. So that is you know not as far advanced, obviously, as the power sector's decarbonization overall. But I, there's a lot of interest in areas like renewable natural gas and hydrogen that can help, and we'll just have to see where um, the next few years takes us. This is a record which is not really a hooray record, but I, I mentioned it and I'll uh, segueing into the next record, which also is not a happy one. But here you'll see wholesale power prices broken out by region of the country, and you'll see a big red um, spike. And you'll remember last February, we had a very significant cold event and it impacted a number of states, including the state of Texas. And its regulating uh, body, ERCOT, um, is listed here, and that is where this big, steep increase was. Now, of course, that was um, related to both the severe event, but also the way the Texas market is structured, which is very specific. But I think it is important to look at, especially when you think about this next slide, which deals with increased costs and really a benchmark for the increasing impacts of climate change that we are experiencing here in the United States. And this is here is pulling out, um, you know, we spent $145 billion in addressing disasters in 2021. It's the third highest, uh, but you know, it's very, very significant for us as a country. And it, it means that the way we would plan in the past is not the way that we're going to be able to plan in the future. And so that's where I make the connection between the, 
the increase in wholesale power prices. We had this dramatic increase with a dramatic event. And you know, we're increasingly seeing a very diverse uh, and unfortunate set of disasters across the country in the United States. So we want to mitigate those kinds of price spikes for families and businesses. We want to be able to continue to um, provide energy services as well as other important services in our economy. And we're going to need to be planning differently and be more resilient. So kind of wrapping up the, the positives here, um, you know, we saw you know, the, the transition in the electricity, the electric transport industry have a record year with electric vehicle sales. We basically doubled over one year. And I think the other thing that's important to note here is that it's a diversity of, of options. Whereas, you know, for, for most of the last decade, it's really been dominated by one provider, Tesla. Tesla. But now we're seeing more offerings to the public. So um, I know that this is a track, you know, an area that we are tracking closely, and we'll be interested to see where we go in 2022. There's the doubling. So the second R is recovery. So we presented, you know, this data. Um, for a year, for the last year, but we also have it for you know many years going back, and you see a real structural uh, dynamic in the U.S., which is we are more energy productive pretty much every year, year on year. Now, when we were looking at the data for this year as well as the data for last year, we were concerned. You know, we had these you know major disruptions in our economy with unprecedented uh, you know stay-at-home orders and restrictions. And, and what would happen to this metric, this long-term metric that we have had on energy productivity? Well, uh, at the end of 2020, we saw energy productivity continue to increase. Okay, so now we're in 2021 and things are opening up and we saw you know, record-breaking um, growth in, as represented by GDP, but we didn't see our energy consumption match that. We still did not, um, impact negatively our energy productivity. Energy productivity continued to increase, which means that we can grow our economy and it's decoupled from our energy consumption. And other countries are experiencing this too. This is not only a United States dynamic, but I think it's very, very encouraging. And there are many factors that underpin this, but energy efficiency and the investments that we've made long-term in energy efficiency and the policies that have been adopted on energy efficiency clearly have a role to play. Um, and I believe that some of the latest analysis by ACEEE has shown that perhaps up to 60% of the energy productivity gains can be attributed to energy efficiency investments and policies. So um, we also want to think about you know, our greenhouse gas emissions. They did go up. Um, in 2021 as our economy recovered, both in terms of our overall total greenhouse gas emissions as a country and our power sector emissions. But we are still far down the road um, when we look at where we were off of 2005 levels. Overall, our emissions are down, total emissions are down 15% um, from 2005 levels, and our power sector emissions are down 35%. So there was an uptick, um, but it wasn't, you know, taking us back to pre-pandemic levels. I also wanted to show you kind of where our emissions are. And a couple of years ago, transportation overtook power in terms of our largest uh, section of, uh, of emissions by sector. But I think rather than focusing on power and transport where everybody else does, I want you to look at the other areas. They really have not changed. So we have a lot of work to do in terms of industrial um, emissions, for example, on top of the work we need to do to continue to reduce emissions overall. So just closing us out, the last R is renewed ambition. So it's two words, not one, um, but it's really important. I mean, with the beginning of the Biden administration, we are back in the Paris Agreement. New commitments have been put forward in terms of reducing power sector emissions and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions economy-wide as a, as a country under that leadership. 
and you know we, we have a long way to go um but again i think it's important to remember that even with this very unusual set of circumstances in the last couple of years we are you know the, the energy transition is continuing and we are breaking records we are investing more we're deploying more and you know if we can get the right public private partnership um both in policy and investment you know we can get ourselves further down the road and the trajectory to where we need to go to achieve those goals but it's not going to be easy so looking on the right hand side this will show you the overall goals and show you kind of where the power sector fits in but there's a lot in the middle there so again we have a lot of work to do uh, across the economy and then in terms of renewed ambition it would be really important to focus on you know what congress and the administration have done passing the bipartisan infrastructure law was a landmark set of investments across many different industries and at a scale that will really have an impact 80 billion dollars of investment and you can see here in all the areas that it went when this was written you know we were we were kind of closer to january so you know you can use your own definition for build back better um, definitely it is these elements that are in it are still under consideration and i know they would be very impactful if enacted especially in the area of clean energy and energy efficiency tax measures so here too i you know i wanted to focus on closing in terms of renewed ambition on energy efficiency um, we haven't seen as much push in terms of investment and policy in the energy efficiency arena as we had 10 years ago. But what we have done is delivering year on year. So I'd like to come back to you next year and hopefully have more states that have adopted energy efficiency resource standards or see a much more dramatic uptick in utility energy efficiency investment, but know that these long standing investments are working and helping us be more competitive as an economy and also kind of keeping uh, the demand side in check. We also have focused in the area of transportation in the fact book and in terms of renewed ambition, thinking about fuel economy standards has been an area that we've been watching closely. And just in the last couple of weeks, the waiver for California that allows them to have higher levels of fuel economy standards was again granted to California. And it's not just California because there are many states that follow California's lead with regard to fuel economy. So um, this is very important as transportation is the largest area of emissions, but we still have more work to be done here too. So that um, wraps up my overview presentation, and I'm really excited to introduce to you our industry panelists. We're going to do them uh, one each, and they're going to share a little bit of their feedback on what key trends they thought were most impactful or most interesting for their industry sector. And we're going to start with Bill Parsons, um, Vice President of Federal and State Affairs for the American Clean Power Association. Bill, I uh, invite you to please turn on your camera and join us. Lisa, thanks so much. Uh, thanks to Dan and the team at ESI uh, and to you and Emily for your leadership um, uh, at uh, BCSE. Uh, you will recall you and I met um, when I was a staffer on the Hill and the release of the fact book was a not to be missed event for me. Uh, I was always there uh, in the front row and I frequently referred to it uh, throughout the course of the year as kind of my Bible uh, on these issues. And so it's fun for me to be participating in the release of, uh, of this year's fact book. Um, let me say, if we can, if we can switch the slide, uh, I want to, I want to just dwell a little bit on, on this slide, if I could. And the reason I chose to do that is a slide like this can, can give the, the audience here, uh, a sense of trend and also a sense of order of magnitude. So first on trend, um, you can see in the nice color coding, uh, starting from the bottom, you have seen a, a pretty significant, almost a 50% drop in percentage generation from coal since 2011. Um, nuclear, kind of the same. There's not a lot of new nuclear build. Uh, and then uh, natural, natural gas and renewables in the blue where ACP spends its time um, is, is growing. Um, 
I do, uh, I want to note in the blue, uh, I'm, I want to unpack that sort of percentage a little bit and put, put some context around it. The first uh, item is it says including hydro. So, um, and that's important, uh, and it is a zero emission source. If you were to exclude hydro, that 21 would probably drop to about 12 if you were just thinking in terms of like wind, solar, uh, battery storage. Um, and uh, I, I think that's important context to have. Uh, historically speaking, here's another thing that the, the, the mix, even within renewable generation technologies, is itself evolving. Um, and you, you see this reflected in some of the slides in this year's fact book. Historically, if you look at all of the utility scale renewable power deployed to date, about 67% of it is onshore wind, about 30% is solar, and then the remaining two or 3% is battery storage. And that battery storage uh, is really kind of a, a, a function of the last year or two. Um, if, you, if you then turn and you, and you have a forward looking view at what the pipeline uh, looks like in terms of renewable deployment, um, it's, it's, it, it changes, uh, solar takes over. And you're at about 55% of the projects in the pipeline at scale are solar, followed by about 20% um, uh, onshore wind. And then this is something I want to flag for the audience because this is a, it's a dynamic sector. Uh, and there are a number of nascent technologies that are really poised to explode in the next five or 10 years. And I want to call a few of those out. One is energy storage. We saw year over year 196% increase in energy storage deployment. It's a, it's a, it's a really explosive growth rate for energy storage. I told you that the, the, uh, uh, the, the looking backwards number, the retrospective number, the percentage of offshore was an asterisk. It's 15% of the pipeline now. So offshore is really uh, po poised to grow quite a bit. Um, the, uh, um, and then battery storage with that 196% year over year growth in terms of the pipeline going forward, we think that's 10% uh, of the build in, in, in the pipeline. And so I just, for folks thinking about the sector, um, I think uh, the areas of offshore wind, battery storage, um, I'm, gonna th I'm gonna throw in uh, green hydrogen, uh, I think is getting a lot of excitement and I think is poised for some exciting growth. Uh, and then also, frankly, the transmission uh, that we're gonna need uh, for, these, for these new resources to bring resource uh, to load um, is gonna be uh, uh, really an important feature here. Now, a report like this can have, um, you know, there's a lot of wins here, and I think there is a lot to celebrate. I do, however, especially for our, uh, our audience here, you know, coming to us from the Hill, I, I wanna caveat this a little bit of just in terms of what we're seeing in the market. There are some headwinds here that, that are important to, to understand, uh, and they range from um, supply chain issues to trade policy, uh, Lisa, you mentioned sort of policy uncertainty. Uh, it, it, businesses of all kinds need certainty to plan. I think that's an issue. Um, uh, siting and permitting challenges. The more we grow, the more that becomes a factor. Uh, extremely long and costly interconnection queues. A lot of people, unless you're kind of like a, a, a power market, you know, RTO, ISO nerd, you might not be aware of, of all these interconnection queues where all these these projects that are ready to go gigawatts um, are just kind of languishing in a very, very long line. And we could even be doing better if we could find some steps to, to shorten uh, that line. And then I've already mentioned uh, the transmission um, that's sort of a cousin issue to that um, to help um, uh, sort of uh, get, get that um, resolved. Um, so uh, a lot of wins um, in the past year uh, and a lot to look forward to, um, but also I think it's important to be clear eyed about the headwinds that we face and not, you know, not take progress for granted. Uh, lastly, as a kind of uh, unifying observation, I, I just I want to be able to say that I, I am and I appreciate Emily kind of setting the, the table um, at the top. I think we all need to be mindful about what's going on in Ukraine right now. And um, uh, I think whether you're a climate hawk or you're in all of the above -er, or you're concerned about inflation, or you're interested in reshoring a supply chain in a rapidly growing sector of the economy, or you're deeply committed to homegrown energy security, growing this clean power sector is an integral part of that solution. And it's something that we can all uh, be working on together. So with that, let me tip it back to you and I'll look forward to comments from the rest of my colleagues and, and some Q&A to follow. Sounds terrific. Thank you, Bill. Really appreciate it.
You bet. Our next industry panelist is Vincent Barnes, Senior Vice President for Policy and Research at the Alliance to Save Energy. Vincent, I invite you to turn your camera on, please. I think we were on, Lisa. Yay, okay, good. Um, well, the floor is yours. We'd love to hear your reactions to uh, both current the current moment and the trends in the fact book. No, oh, thank you, Lisa. Um, good afternoon, and certainly it's a pleasure uh, to participate in today's briefing on the uh, 2022 Sustainable Energy in America Energy Fact Book. And um, congratulations to BCSC on the 10th year of the Fact Book and the work that you're doing, Lisa, as well, and your team over there. Um, certainly, as Lisa indicated, my name is Vincent Barnes, and I'm with the Alliance to Save Energy. Uh, the Alliance to Save Energy is a nonprofit, uh, bipartisan alliance of business, uh, government, environmental and consumer leaders really working to increase investments in energy efficiency. Uh, put simply, energy efficiency is the reduction of energy intensity, if you will, um, or the amount of energy required to power the economy um, or our everyday lives. It, it's, it's traveling on aircraft with highly efficient engine systems, um, producing and manufacturing goods using far less energy than what was required only 10 years ago, um, while still producing more. Um, it's driving further and faster with greater and larger amounts of supplied fuel going directly to the drive and braking systems. And it's heating and cooling and operating our homes and businesses um, at the highest levels um, while requiring lesser and lesser amounts of natural gas and electricity. Um, uh, because of the effect of energy efficiency technologies on energy consumption, um, energy efficiency has a direct impact um, on reducing energy em uh, carbon emissions. Um, increasing energy reliability and helping to meet the needs um, of grid and pipeline resiliency. And certainly um, um, a, a key into current events um, uh, results in overall increased energy security as well. Importantly, energy efficiency technologies are ranging from passive efficiency uh, products such as um, insulation uh, and energy star rated windows. Uh, to what we would call active efficiency solutions, uh, such as grid connected appliances and equipment um, and grid integrated enabled buildings. Um, all of these things help keep energy affordable. Uh, energy efficiency alone can reduce uh, carbon emissions by 50% by 2050. If we're, if, if we're linking energy efficiency to in, in terms of its role and impact on carbon emissions. Um, moreover, through energy efficiency, um, we also have the ability to achieve um, according to the IEA, 40% um, of the emission reductions required by the Paris Agreement. Um, that said, in addition to effectively reducing carbon emissions, um, energy efficiency also plays an essential role um, in reducing energy demand and load on the grid and pipeline systems. In, in fact, um, and Lisa, you, you mentioned this earlier, without investments in energy efficiency since 1980, U.S. energy consumption would actually be about 60% higher today. Um, the, the slide from the fact book um, gives us a sense um, as to energy consumption um, throughout um, uh, major parts of the US economy, um, certainly, but uh, the double impact of energy efficiency should be a major component of US energy um, and climate, US energy policy and certainly climate policy as well. And that double impact, of course, is its ability to reduce carbon emissions, but also the, the, uh, the ability of energy efficiency um, to reduce um, uh, energy consumption. Um, we, we, we certainly need energy efficiency to expedite emission reductions, and we will need energy efficiency to address anticipated increased energy demand, um, particularly as we move and, and rely more heavily on variable fuel resources. Um, according to projections, um, when segmenting solely for electricity consumption, right, um, we learned that based on electrification policies and anticipated electric vehicle growth, um, we could actually see a 40% increase in electricity consumption by 2050, and which would um, lead to the need for us to install double 2018 capacity levels. Um, however, the same studies um, um, uh, coming from NREL, the same studies um, that identify the energy challenge in front of us, they also tell us where the solution is as well, and that, and that is energy efficiency. Um, according to NREL, uh, grid costs will increase 
to serve the, uh, the growing load. But with rapid investments in energy efficiency technologies, we could realize up to $800 billion in net energy system savings. Um, so certainly from a policy perspective, um, this means expansion and passage of tax incentives that encourage businesses and consumers to invest in energy efficiency products and equipment, including uh, 25, the 25C um, tax credit for homeowners, uh, the 45L tax credit for single and multifamily home builders, and the 179D deduction uh, for commercial buildings. It also means passage of programs such as Hope for Homes. Um, that provide rebates when investing in, in energy efficient um, products and equipment. Um, and, um, and would also be important for those who might not itemize uh, for tax savings. Um, and it means establishing and developing strong building performance standards um, and energy codes. It, it also means funding advanced research and development of energy efficiency technologies, including through relevant um, Department of Energy offices, uh, such as uh, the Buildings Technology Office, um, Advanced Manufacturing Office, the Vehicle Technologies Office, and others. And, and though I'm not attempting to be exhaustive here in terms of um, where the policy and energy efficiency meet, um, it also means substantive investments in initiatives such as the Weatherization Assistance Program and state energy programs as well. And so I'm going to end there. And with that, um, um, Lisa, thank you again for the opportunity. And I look forward um, to hearing from our colleagues on the on the panel and, and uh, getting to our questions and answers. Thank you very much, Vincent. And yes, look forward to continuing that, especially in the policy realm. So I'd like to introduce next Aaron Duncan, Vice President of Congressional Affairs for the Solar Energy Industries Association. Aaron, I invite you to turn on your camera. There we are. Can you see me? Yes. Great. You look great. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, thank you, Lisa, so much for inviting me to present um, in association with the rollout of the fact book. Um, it's always great to be on a panel with my colleagues from our um, sister and brother trade associations talking about the issues that are really important to their um, membership. And I'm here today to share some elements from the fact book that are critically important to the solar industry and to also raise some ideas that um, Vincent touched on a little bit around the expansion of solar energy and also making sure that um, it is accessible to communities around the country who may have previously um, not been able to access clean um, solar energy um, or been unduly harmed by um, previous um, energy load. Can we turn to the next slide, please? So we talked, uh, Lisa did a great job at the beginning of the session talking about the tremendous growth that the solar industry has um, uh, experienced over the last year. Um, Echoing what Bill said earlier, supply chain has certainly been a challenge for our industry, and we continue to face a number of threats to our ability to continue to grow at this incredible rate um, uh, moving forward. There's both supply chain issues as well as this ominous thought, um, threat of trade um, sanctions that will definitely. Um, cause some serious harm for the ability of our industry to continue to grow at this rate. However, um, you can see from this slide, um, solar is certainly um, moving rapidly ahead. Last year, we were 46% um, of all new generating capacity in the United States. And um, we expect to um, install 300 gigawatts of new capacity over the next 10 years. So it's certainly a great time to be in the solar industry. I also want to um, share that, uh, you know, as we grow, it's important that we look at policies that will make solar more accessible to every community around the country. This is a core value of SIA and our membership. We represent a thousand member companies from very small inst installers to some of the largest solar companies in the country, manufacturers and everything in between. It's really important to us as a core value that families 
um, and communities that have otherwise not been able to access solar energy have the tools and resources to do so. And as Vincent mentioned, there are some provisions in the reconciliation bill or whatever we end up calling it um, that would make that more make that easier for families. For example, refundability in 25D is um, a tool that will help more families install residential solar. Um, we, it is something that we have long um, hoped for and worked across um, coalitions with um, climate activists and environmental justice groups to um, get that into the reconciliation bill. And we hope that that sticks. That's incredibly important to us. In addition, um, we're also very excited about the way that the tax credits are um, structured to incentivize investments in communities that had perhaps been previously overlooked or who would benefit the most from access to clean solar energy, whether through um, utility scale solar or community solar, um, where there are the way that the tax credits and the Reconciliation Act have been structured provide additional incentives to developers to go into those communities, um, tribal areas, low income communities, and communities that have been um, unduly impacted by the tra energy transition and to put solar energy there. And I think that is incredibly important. Um, as we look at the opportunity that the clean energy transition will offer our country, we really have the chance to do it right. We have the chance to center um, uh, our focus on making sure that no one is left behind as we engage in this clean energy transition. And um, we're really excited about continuing to grow the solar market, but to make sure that it is accessible to everyone across the country. And finally, uh, aligned with those thoughts, I want to talk a little bit about workforce development. I think um, as this slide shows, um, there are hundreds of thousands of jobs um, in the energy sector. The solar industry has about 231,000 people working in it um, in 2021. We expect that over um, the next um, five years, we're going to need to grow that um, number by hundreds of thousands of jobs. And we're also hoping to grow the number of people who are working in the domestic manufacturing sector of the solar industry. Um, we are very excited um, to continue to work to expand um, domestic manufacturing here in this country and create tens of thousands of new jobs in communities, again, that perhaps had seen um, their manufacturing um, base decline in previous years, and we're hoping that policies in the Reconciliation Bill can help to um, expand and um, build that out more. We view that as incredibly important to the future of our industry. But also important is the training and um, recruitment and retention of all of these people that all of our industries are going to need in order to facilitate the transition to clean energy. And it's critically important that we think about how best to um, engage communities that perhaps were not exposed to clean energy. You know, you, you are interested in and often study uh, issues that um, you see. And so um, it's really important that we uh, it have policies like um, Solar Ready Vets, as well as um, uh, workforce development programs within um, Build Back Better and elsewhere that focus on finding new clean energy workers in communities and training them, whether, it, whether it's in energy efficiency or into the solar industry or into, as you see there, um, funneling it for, into a union apprentice, apprenticeship um, to create careers out of clean energy. Um, there is so much hope and potential as we transition um, into this next phase of the energy mix. Solar is going to be a huge part of it, um, but our hope is that it reflects um, the true breadth and diversity of our country and that um, the growth and opportunity that the solar industry can bring um, is felt in every community across the country. So um, uh, we're really excited and we 
again, thank you, Lisa, for um, inviting me to present on this panel. Oh, thank you, Erin. I love your vision, and we want to go back and talk some more about that in the Q&A, so uh, thank you. Our final uh, panelist is Mark Lessons, Director of Regulatory and Environmental Affairs for Johnson Controls. Mark, I invite you to turn your camera on. Can you see me okay? Yes, wonderful. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Yours, yours, Mark. Great to have you. Thank you, Lisa, and also really grateful to Dan and the EESI team for hosting us uh, and, and really letting us be a part of, of the, uh, the briefing schedule that, that you guys put together for the year. Uh, so as Lisa said, my name is Mark Lessons and I'm with Johnson Controls. For those of you that aren't familiar with Johnson Controls, we're really an end-to-end -end provider of technology solutions for buildings, everything from heating, cooling, and ventilation equipment to fire life and security products, um, sensors, controls, building management systems, and now increasingly uh, digital solutions that, that really help optimize everything in a building, leverage, leverage data sources from inside and outside of the building, and really start to deliver the outcomes that, we're, uh, that we come to expect from the building sector. Uh, so, I, you know, my, my goal today is to really elevate buildings as a uh, key tenant of how we uh, ultimately address climate change. And, uh, you know, it, it's important. Buildings are responsible for about 40% of greenhouse gas emissions globally. And so it, frankly, is not possible to address climate change in earnest without having a, uh, a, a real clear picture about how we're going to put buildings on a path to net zero. So. If you go to the next slide, please, Lisa. Uh, what we're looking at here is how we are addressing um, uh, energy efficiency and decarbonization in new construction. This is the rate of uh, adoption of building energy codes across the country. And these building energy codes have made tremendous strides. Uh, the model energy codes that the, the Department of Energy uses is the uh, International Energy Conservation Code and ASHRAE Standard 90.1. Uh, both of those codes have made, you know, I, I, you know by some estimations, about a 50% uh, uh, reduction in the overall energy intensity of the building sector over the past 30 to 40 years. And mo most states and cities are adopting some version and some more recent version of these codes which is really delivering uh, tremendous benefits to the uh, building sector for in, in new construction um, in terms of both energy savings and uh, carbon emissions reductions. Um, the the uh, challenge here though, is that, uh, you know, again, by some estimates, new construction by, that we're building uh, today and through 2050 is really only going to account for about 20% of the total building stock uh, of all buildings uh, globally uh, by 2050. So that means that if we uh, want to address the building sector and, and truly address uh, uh, the, the, um, the, the necessary uh, um, initiatives to reduce carbon emissions, we really have to figure out a way to retrofit existing buildings at scale and, and continue to put them on a path to net zero just as the uh, just as the uh, codes for new construction are. One of the uh, really interesting policy measures that, uh, that we're pretty uh, bullish about at JCI is something called building performance standards, which set uh, you know, effectively mandatory energy or carbon emissions benchmarks for existing buildings. Uh, and you know, they're, they're completely performance-based. They, they tend not to prescribe what technology you use or how you get there, but they do require that buildings meet a certain threshold for energy efficiency uh, or carbon emissions by certain deadlines. And that's really a, gonna be an important measure for how we put the, build, the, the building sector on a path to net zero and drive a lot of these retrofits. Uh, some of you may have seen a recent announcement uh, from the uh, White House Council on Environmental Quality that announced a, uh, co a building performance standards coalition of 33 cities and states that uh, either have or will adopt these building performance standards. And the, the total square footage covered by these, these cities and states is pretty tremendous. Uh, you know, we're talking, I, I believe, roughly 19, 20 million uh, square feet of commercial uh, floor space is gonna be impacted by these, uh, by these building performance standards. And 
you know, so again, a, a really exciting and important way that we're going to put uh, buildings on the path to net zero uh, and really start to drive those, those all important retrofits uh, in order to get them there. Uh, so, so we'll be excited to see uh, the, the uh, results of that and, and um, additional um, cities and states uh, also consider uh, uh, additional measures such as building performance standards to try to drive buildings on that trajectory. Uh, but it's something that we think is, is, is going to be a really important tool for ultimately getting us, excuse me, to, to net zero by 2050. Uh, lastly, if I could just make, you know, just raise one additional point or thought as, as I take a step back and think about buildings, you know, buildings are, uh, buildings have become extremely important to, to our overall way of life. If we think about what we were asking buildings to do, even two years ago compared to today, uh, we're, we're talking not just about energy efficiency and, and saving uh, um, uh, building owners and, and families on their utility bills. We're now looking at uh, buildings as a means to achieve our climate goals, yes, but we're also really relying on buildings and, and uh, performance improvements in buildings to help us uh, reopen and reemerge from COVID. If we think about the total amount of emphasis is being placed on indoor air quality and indoor environmental quality that's really being delivered in buildings by the building systems uh, in order to make sure that the rate of clean air inside of a building is safe and acceptable for people to occupy them and uh, not worry about transmitting an airborne pathogen like COVID or, or other viruses. That's an extremely important additional function for buildings that have really come to, to, to define what makes a sustainable building. And in the future, it's not just going to, you know, it's not just going to be responding to a pandemic, but the other emergencies we've seen, uh, we've, we've had to take shelter in buildings during times of wildfires and other crises. And as we look to the future, uh, as we expand uh, all of these distributed resources on and off the grid to, to help decarbonize and, and manage our overall energy system, we're also going to be looking to buildings to help balance the grid and uh, provide really valuable services back to the grid in order to make this transition go more smoothly and deliver, again, all of these outcomes that the, the occupants of buildings uh, have come to expect. I would say despite that now in increasing list of um, requirements that we're placing on buildings, we are uh, very rapidly coming up with new uh, performance measures and ways to make sure that we are delivering on all of those things. But I still, uh, you know, we're still really optimistic that despite all of that, we can we can still keep buildings on a pathway to achieving net zero uh, by 2050. There, there's just there, there's so, we have so many technology solutions at our disposal to significantly reduce energy consumption and help optimize, you know, building systems, subsystems, buildings as a whole really enable buildings to grid communication, buildings to distributed energy resource communication, building, you know optimization between buildings and vehicles, all of these things are starting to evolve very quickly and ultimately enabling us to uh, very fine tune, finely tune the operation of buildings to again, deliver on the, the necessary uh, uh, emissions reductions in order to achieve our climate goals and deliver those outcomes for, uh, for customers. So very excited about the future and what the future holds for building technologies and the role that this is going to play in the overall uh, decarbonization picture and certainly eager to uh, chat more about buildings and, and, and buildings, uh, uh, buildings to grid integration as a whole uh, during the, the uh, discussion portion of the presentation as well as in uh, follow-up conversations as well. So thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, it's terrific. I definitely wanna come back and, and you had a lot in there that was really interesting about the new policies and, and what the administration is doing uh, with performance standards for buildings. So we'll definitely come back to you on that. Um, I just want to remind everybody that, all, again, all this information and more is available off the BCSE website for free. So go, hop, go in there, hop in there, um, and also let us know what you think. We very much want your feedback. So feel free to reach out to the BCSE with any reactions or questions you have. And I hope that you will uh, participate in our conversation right now as well. So. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to invite all the panelists, plus Dan uh, Brissett and Emily Duncan, to join us on screen. Hi, everybody. 
Really excellent remarks, really, really helpful um, going a level deeper in terms of what these trends are showing. And Dan and I are gonna um, ask you some questions uh, to go perhaps even further. Um, first question, and, and we, we also wanna say, you know, all panelists can answer these questions. So you'll keep this as conversational as we can. Uh, just hop on in if, if there's a comment that you'd like to make. I'd love to start with you, Erin, if I could, because you know you talked about two different things, but very important in terms of the growth and expansion of solar in the country. You talked about the need um, to have it, you know, positively impact all communities and have you know kind of diversity in mind when you're thinking about your both expansion um, in terms of the types of communities that can benefit from solar, but also in your your workforce. So. I'd like to see if you could chat a little bit on those topics. You mentioned some things in legislation that's pending. Maybe talk in addition, you know, talk about what those things are and why they would be helpful in terms of making improvements in those areas, please. Great, thank you so much for that question. Yeah, this is something that we're really um, passionate about at SIA and um, have taken some really positive steps over the last several years to help lead our industry forward in this regard. Because for us, um, a diverse workforce and um, a diverse uh, customer base um, brings strength to our industry. And um, I think you uh, need to only look uh, as far as um, how we are going to fill all of these jobs. As I shared in my remarks, we're going to need hundreds of thousands of new solar workers. And um, there's a workforce shortage in many parts of this country in this space. But um, folks only tend to um, be attracted to jobs that they understand and know about. And so part of the role of all of us on the panel, energy efficiency, wind, offshore, although I'm not sure I would wanna be on an offshore wind um, <laughs> turbine, so. Um, offshore wind people for um, those with, with uh, a lot of courage, um, uh, solar installer, um, and, and the myriad other occupations within the solar industry um, is exposure and getting the word out and looking and recruiting in new ways uh, among our companies. SIA recently unveiled a certification program for our um, solar industry where companies can work through some online training to help uh, build their skill set in terms of uh, DEIJ issues, but also looking at how one recruits, where one recruits, and how you plug into, plug new um, faces and new communities into the solar industry. So that's one way we are trying to um, make that change. But there's also legislation on the Hill that has been really important. Um, the Blue Collar to Green Collar Jobs Act um, that, um, uh, would provide incentives to help um, move people uh, who either are, you know, in categories of folks who have lost their jobs in fossil fuels or, or, or elsewhere, um, or just in underserved communities, help connecting them to jobs in renewables, in energy efficiency. Um, that's really important, and we do some seed money to help that move forward is really important as well. And I think there's also some provisions in Build Back Better baked into the ITC now around um, apprenticeships that can be deeply transformative. Now, we first we have to pass that bill. So everybody on the Hill, um, get back to your desks as soon as you're done watching this uh, presentation. But, um, you know, there, I think the, I think uh, leadership on the Hill did that very mindfully, looking at, um, a certain percentage of workers on um, job sites have to be um, apprentices, apprentices or um, trainees and um, making sure that we're constantly building um, the, the necessary workforce to help us get um, down the road in the future. So I think those are some elements. There's, there's many more. Um, I could talk about, um, you know, putting, put, even something like putting solar on schools, which is a provision in the bipartisan infrastructure law. 
um, exposes or gives um, public schools an opportunity to use that as um, an area to teach um, students about renewable energy and how it works. Um, so there's there's so many opportunities, and I think as we see more clean energy inst installed around the country, um, you know, hopefully that will raise awareness of the tremendous opportunity that exists in the sector. Thanks, Erin. Yeah, that was really helpful. Let me see if anybody else wants to chime in on that topic. Um, ahead, sure. Lisa. Yeah, thanks. I, I and um, appreciate Erin's comments. So uh, I, I do want to start. I mean, we this the sector is definitely going to be very forward leaning here. But I also if we pull the lens back. Um, today's frontline communities in the energy space are in large part de defined by bearing disproportionate burden associated with uh, historic generation. So I do think I, I, I want to acknowledge that the project we're undertaking here is 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 in itself um, uh, going to be relieving uh, burden uh, in, in, in terms of both pollution uh, as well as as energy costs as a function of income over time. Uh, so there, there's a there's a generic overall good there. Having said that, and I think what Erin has put her finger on is, you know, at the end of this, if we get to net zero, you know, or even it, so, then it, then everybody will be able to benefit from clean power, which is the goal. The, re, the you know the history of this is, if you're not intentional about it, some communities will probably predictably be kind of at the end of the line, and that's not okay. That's the opportunity I think Erin is talking about, um, and it's something I think the sector is very much aligned around, including um, uh, workforce diversity, because we're growing so fast. Uh, and because you know there will there will be the worker need and also and I love the way Aaron put this it's 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 the kind of the chance to do this right um, and so appreciate servicing um, sort of those uh, objectives which are clearly part of the project. Lisa, this is Vincent. I'd like to uh, just chime in briefly, and I'll try to do this in under a minute. As 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 we think about energy affordability, um, energy efficiency is really that 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 quintessential tool that does that right. It has the ability. Um, uh, to bring the to, to bring the cost of energy down um, for the end user, and it's, it's it's particularly important for those in low income communities, be that rural or urban. Um, and, as we as as we think about lowering the energy burden, and something a, a fact that's not often known is that um, low income families in rural communities have have the highest have some of the highest energy burdens, and um, and energy efficiency has the ability to um uh, to, to, to to alleviate that burden. Importantly, as we think about energy efficiency and, and, and energy efficiency as a tool, it's one thing to understand what the technology does. It's another thing to get that technology into the homes. And so as, 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 as we think about equity and what equity means, for energy efficiency, equity means universal access. Not, that, not simply that that tool is um, at a Home Depot or at a Lowe's or somewhere else, um, but, but, but that, that, that tax policy or rebate policy um, in general, um, makes it easier for those products to be into the homes of low-income individuals. Um, one other point, um, um, since we're talking about workforce development, this will drive um, workforce growth in the energy efficiency sector. Um, another fact, um, oftentimes not, not, not talked about a lot, but energy efficiency is the largest employer um, in the clean energy sector. And so think about if, 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 we're, if we're driving energy efficiency, um, as we're transforming um, our, our energy policy, um, we are also driving additional jobs in that sector as well. And so, and, and so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. No, that, that was great. Thank you all. I don't know, Emily or Mark, if you wanted to chime in on this. I'll give you a second. No? No? Okay. Well, I want to go back to something that a few of you hit on, obviously, you know, front of mind uh, for probably every constituent services person who's working in a congressional office right now is inflation. Um, some of you, you talked about that a little bit in your remarks. How does your industry or deployment of your sector impact inflation? I mean, I realize we're gonna be speaking um, in some broad economic terms here now, but you know, it's something that I've been thinking a lot about um, and, what, and what the value of, of what our industries bring in terms of helping businesses and helping families right now. Who maybe Bill? Do you want to go first? Yeah, one thing, surely. So thanks for that. Um, I I, I want to uh, the the slide that you that you showed that had the the the, the power prices, and it showed the spike in ERCOT 
um, last year, and then also a little bit in SPP, which I'm, I'm going to assume is a function of the same severe weather pattern because SPP also covers the center por portion of the country where winter storm URI had, had that effect. Um, what sort of, an, an un, we had, a, 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 I was on a, a, a call with Barbara Sugg who ran, who's the president of SPP, which is the Southwest Power Pool. That's the power market, the organized power market in the middle of the country that sits right on top of Texas. And she shared something really fascinating, which is, and this is both a reliability as well as a price issue. Um, they had meaningfully less disruption in her power market than did ERCOT in its, and that disruption is, was the, the, the blackouts, but also the price spikes that, that you captured on your deck. And the reason for that was because they could pull power, ex excess power from all the way from PJM, which is the power market on the East Coast, through MISO into SPP to keep the lights on in, five mil in, in over 5 million uh, homes uh, and at an affordable price. At the same time that Texas was experiencing its blackouts, there was power available 100 miles away for 90% less, less money. The, the, then why do I raise all of this? I mentioned transmission. We need to have a better interconnected grid across the seams between power markets and be able to push electrons from where they're produced uh, to where they're needed far more readily than we can today. You had sort of alluded, and this is a choice that the state has made to date, um, or ERCOT is kind of jurisdictionally islanded on, for historical reasons on purpose. If they had greater interconnectivity between themselves um, and the adjoining states and, and power markets, freer flow of, 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 of abundant, affordable, clean electrons, um, probably everybody would be uh, better served from a reliability point of view, as well as a price point of view. <clears throat> I'd like to weigh in. Um, th I think there's there's a lot of similar themes to, to what Bill just said on the demand side as well at the buildings level. I talked a, a little bit about the need for uh, 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 demand or load optimization and, uh, and buildings to grid capability. Uh, to the, you know, there is a lot that can be done to help uh, manage energy costs at varying times of day when you have, um, you know, when, when buildings have the flexibility to manage their loads. And so the more that we can do to give buildings the ability to uh, shift their loads from periods of time where demand is high and, and thus uh, the, the retail price of electricity is, is extremely high to periods of time where uh, electricity might actually be free uh, is, is extremely valuable. And that can be done with digital solutions that are, that are uh, leveraging data uh, from the building and from outside of the building, distributed resources that can be, uh, that can be installed as, you know, behind the meter as part of the building and really leveraged as part of that overall operational flexibility. Uh, and then also to the extent that a building might have multiple sources of energy, uh, that diversification can allow the building to leverage either one, depending on which one happens to be cheaper or less carbon intensive or what have you, uh, in order to make sure that it's ultimately delivering those, again, those outcomes that customers are expecting at the lowest possible cost and lowest possible carbon footprint. So I don't have a great, uh, I suppose I don't have a great answer for how to uh, reduce the cost of resources uh, at the <laughs> Um, uh, from inflation, but I would say the more that we can do to add flexibility to our demand side assets and and uh, and diversification, the better protected uh, building end users will be from those spikes in retail electricity costs that we'll see. If I could just yeah, go ahead. Add, ahead. If I could just add one more thing on the on the subject of inflation, um, two thoughts. One. Um, when we have challenges in the supply chain, when we have things like tariffs that are impacting our inputs, our uh, materials that we need to um, build this clean energy, that contributes to additional costs to install the clean energy. So that's, that's a challenge. But I do wanna give an example of um, places where, you know, solar in particular is already at work um, helping control those costs as, as my colleagues have mentioned. Um, we did quite a bit of research a couple of years ago and learned a lot about the use of solar on farms in particular. And we have examples of, um, depending on, uh, in this case, it was Iowa's NEM policy, uh, a certain farmer was able to bank credits 
um, from the solar panels installed on his property and then dry his corn for free. Um, and for those of you who don't come from corn country like I do, um, that is an incredibly energy intensive um, process and can run into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So for particularly for, um, uh, you know, for everyone, but in just that particular example, um, that is a place where, um, you know, costs, as my colleagues have already mentioned, can, can really be firmly um, held, but, but the inputs have to also um, be cost. And we've seen the solar, solar and storage prices go down over the last several years, but um, these unknowns around um, tariffs uh, threaten um, those, those prices at the moment. Thanks. Hey, Lisa, Emily, just, like to, oh, sorry, Vincent. You no, want to, just, no, no, chime in, please. We're not done with inflation. Go ahead. Emily, I yeah, have a no, question just for you on a different topic. Go ahead, Vincent. No, you go ahead. Okay. Thank, thanks, thanks, Bill. I, I, I couldn't miss the opportunity to talk about energy efficiency and affordability, right? It's, I mean, it's, it's, they, 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 they actually um, go hand in hand. Two, two pieces on that, though, and as, as we think about inflation, look, I, um, we think that the president got it right in the State of the Union. Um, when he identified energy efficiency um, um, as a key way by which consumers, by which we can make energy affordable for consumers. And, 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 and we think that that, that, is, that is absolutely right. If you are, if you are watching your television, if you are, if you are, if you are drive, driving your vehicle, if you are washing your clothes and, and, and the equipment or the product type that you are using is requiring less energy, um, from the grid or, or through um, a pipeline system, then you are paying less um, either at the pump um, or, or, and, and you are paying less um, in your, on your utility bill. The other affordability um, um, aspect that I'd like to discuss just briefly, um, we, we should be wide-eyed um, about um, what the cost of infrastructure um, for energy actually is and what it will be as we do, as Bill indicated, as, as, we, as we try to connect the grid um, across the country. Um, th there's a cost there and those costs impact rates. And, and one of the ways to keep those costs down and under control um, is through energy efficiency. If the intensity on the grid is lessened, then the need for additional infrastructure is also reduced. And so, and so energy efficiency has a way of um, impacting affordability, both on the supply side of the equation and also the demand side. And I'll stop there. So well said, that, Bill. Yeah, that, that's indisputably true. And, and, and at the same time, we know to connect new generation, we're gonna, we're gonna need grid investment. And, and just to contextualize, Lisa, because it is part of this year's fact book, you, you had a, a slide on the, on the, um, uh, on the BIF. Uh, there was a, a starter investment there uh, a, 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 for, for grid modernization. I think, however, the, um, the real ball game is in the clean energy tax credit as part of the, the Build Back Better uh, uh, program, uh, where there's a, a proposed new freestanding uh, ITC, both for long haul transmission, as well as for energy storage. And both of these technologies are tech neutral, broad bipartisan support, and needed for grid reliability as, as well as uh, grid decarbonization. I just wanted to make sure we left our audience with a place to go if they were, you know, kind of uh, excited about making progress there without just throwing out the problem without offering potential pathways for solution. Agreed wholeheartedly. Um, I'd like to bring Emily into the conversation, you know, kind of big picture uh, as a company like National Grid going through the energy transition. What's your reaction to what you've heard so far? Um, I want to leave this very open-ended because I think for the audience, you know, you're kind of an additional kind of practical implementer. And what do the trends say to you? Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Um, and I'm trying to think of, you know, there's so much here, right? And so how to, how to present this in a, in a coherent fashion. I mean, look, I think what we're seeing, obviously, with Ukraine and with inflation is costs going up. And for a lot of our customers, their energy bills are sometimes their biggest cost every month. Um, and so we have to be very mindful that we are providing affordable, reliable energy to our customers. Uh, and we think we can do that and continue to, to on this path to net zero, right? The, the states in which we operate in, Massachusetts, New York, and Rhode Island, all have very aggressive 
uh, climate targets. And we are in partnership with them to help them meet those targets. Um, but we also have to continue to keep an eye right on this affordability piece, um, on this reliability piece. And I think as, as Aaron so eloquently put it, right, we need to make sure that we're not leaving anyone behind. Um, so we serve customers in the wealthy parts of Brooklyn, but we also serve upstate New York, right? So how do we ensure that we're meeting the needs of the, of the wide variety of customers and the economic um, circumstances that they find themselves in? So I think that's one point I'd make. So, you know, when we see inflation costs go up, that just puts even more inflation go up, that just puts more pressure, right, on the other areas of people's lives um, where they're also seeing costs increase. I think the other thing we're looking at is, you know, we talk a lot about um, kind of the electric side. I think that's really been a large focus here, but we also have the heating portion of our business, right? And so how do we, you know, efficiently and affordably provide um, heat to, our, to homes, which is quite critical uh, in the Northeast. Um, and so we have a large gas distribution uh, business and um, that can be a challenge, right? In the progressive states in which we operate in. And so what we're working really hard on is figuring out how do we green our gas system? How do we find enough green hydrogen and RNG and create and develop a real market for those um, resources so that we can start pushing that through the, the distribution pipeline system that we have and that has worked very well and served our customers very well for, for decades and that they've invested and our company has invested significant uh, significant dollars in. Um, and so that's, you know, going back to kind of some of the policies that folks have been talking about, that's why the Democrats reconciliation bill is is another great um, piece of legislation that we need to see passed in addition to the IIJA. There's a hydrogen production tax credit in there that we think is absolutely critical to driving down the cost of hydrogen. DOE is very focused. They have a hydrogen shot on driving down the cost of hydrogen. It harkens back to my days at SIA when we had a solar shot, right? And what that did for the industry in bringing down the cost of these resources. So I think there's a lot of great work going on, right? Both in Congress and in the federal agencies to help drive down the cost of these resources. R&D is critical that, you know, um, it, it gets tons of bipartisan support and we um, in the utility industry are very supportive of that. So there's lots of ways I think to tackle this. Um, and that's why I think, you know, again, the fact book and BCSE are so important because it's bringing together these voices across the energy sector to try to figure out these problems and how do all of these ingredients come together um, to, to ensure that we're providing, you know, a, a clean, affordable and reliable power for, for Americans. Thanks, Emily. Um, I'd love to invite Dan Brissett to ask a question, make some comments. Uh, what's on your mind, Dan? Well, I have a question that I suspect everyone will want to answer. So this may end up being our last one, which is a bummer because this could keep going. Um, but I'm gonna ask a question about sort of where policymakers should be focused. And so i um, happy to start maybe at the top of the order. Bill, we'll start with you and then maybe go through in the order of our presentations. Lisa? I'd love to hear from you as well. And I even have an answer that I don't think anyone else is gonna say. So I'm gonna save this one too. But what is the most important thing policymakers can be focusing on, Bill, if we wanna return a year from now with more records and more, more good stuff to talk about in terms of a clean energy transition in the US? Yeah, thanks for that, Dan. So it's, 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 um, it's kind of the obverse of the headwinds that I, I kind of mentioned, uh, you know, at the top of this conversation, right? So, but let me start with, with removing the policy uncertainty. And I, I do think, and all of the modeling shows this, particularly for those who are climate minded, if we're, if we're, if we're aiming at the administration's, you know, 80% decarbon the power sector by 2030, or we're completely net zero by 2035. And then, you know, that can that can unlock decarbonization across other sectors in, in the economy. So it's important we get that done sooner rather than later. Um, the the very best chance we have for that, I think the, the the BIF was a decent down payment, but the very best chance we have for that is the comprehensive clean energy tax platform uh, envisioned by uh, you know the House passed Build Back Better Act. So I'm I'm hopeful we can all work together to get some version of that across the finish line. Uh, my colleague Aaron Duncan has mentioned, I think we have to have supportive trade policy here. And I, there's a lot of interest in the sector in reshoring our supply chain. Um, but I think we need, there's, there's a sort of a, a climate compatible uh, and climate supportive way of doing that. And, and there's, there are other ways to do that. And we're looking to do that in a climate supportive way uh, and, and to be smart um, uh, about that. And as it turns out, um, the OSOF provisions um, in, in the Build Back Better Act, we think as opposed to kind of a tariff heavy approach are far more likely to onshore um, these manufacturing facilities and the jobs and investment they represent. Um, lastly, I think and this is this this is a tough one. Let me just uh, let me let me stipulate that um, I've one of my jobs at ACP is, is, is to oversee our state affairs work. 
And there isn't a state, you know, we're deploying everywhere across the country, and there isn't a state that, you know, in the union that doesn't have siting and permitting challenges. Um, and, and I think we need, we need to, I think that we, we have a vast majority of Americans uh, kind of on board with the vision because we know we have to. Uh, and it, but it gets tricky when, when you try to, do, you know, when you when you take the general to the specific, that's when it can get hard. And I just think we're going to have to work through this together in order not um, in, in order to achieve our objective, which which will be a common good. So let me I'm, I'm sure others will have uh, good thoughts there. Let me let me step back and let them jump in. Thanks, Vincent. No, absolutely. It's a, it, it, it's a great question. I, I, I would say, first of all, we would have to begin to, as policy collaborators and policy makers, um, see energy efficiency um, as important to energy policy and climate policy um, as we do on the supply side of the equation. So just as much as we invest um, in, in oil and natural gas, and as much as we invest in, 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 in clean energy technologies, we also have to see energy efficiency as a, as, a, as, a, as a substantive component to our energy policy. And we have to invest in it um, at, the, at, at the same levels, if not more, quite frankly. Um, we, we also have to ensure that as we do that, that we identify pathways to make access to energy efficiency technologies universal. Um, whether, whether that's through rebate programs um, or, 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 or greater opportunities provided through utilities at the state level um, in order to work um, um, di directly with their customers, we have to find um, additional pathways. To echo some of what Bill said, um, the, um, uh, the, uh, the clean energy tax credits, particularly 25C uh, uh, for energy efficiency, um, 45L and 179D, um, ex extremely important, extremely important to, to, to move those through and give value to those similarly to the way that we give value to the supply side, quite frankly. Um, and, 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 and I will add this and I'll give the mic back after. But um, as we look at 25C, it's, an, it's, it's important in, in understanding um, the, um, the, 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 the policy need to, uh, to, uh, to move toward electrification. Um, we have to understand and realize um, and, and make available uh, the tax credit across the equipment types, regardless of fuel source technologies. Um, there, are, there are a number of parts in the country, particularly in cold climate states, um, where a high efficiency natural gas furnace simply makes more sense. And, and um, at, at least now until the technology catches up, right? Um, and, 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 and because that fact exists, we should be incentivizing individuals into the most efficient, most efficient product type and not simply the product type that necessarily um, um, is identified to move the needle um, uh, based, on, based on a different type of policy other than energy efficiency and cost savings for the consumer. It's all in there. Great, thanks. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, Aaron, I think it's then you, then Mark, and then we'll hear from Emily and we'll give you some second to last word. Well, thanks for this um, really provocative question. And my colleagues have already touched on many of the points that I would make at the top. Um, certainly passing a comprehensive package of climate provisions, um, forward leaning tax policy, um, whatever they can fit into that reconciliation bill will be absolutely critical. We have to have a long runway to give companies um, certainty to build out the infrastructure that we know and we all are in agreement on this call that we need. Um, and I do want to echo um, what Bill said about the importance of domestic manufacturing. I think securing um, stateside supply chains for the solar industry is absolutely critical. Um, and I believe that the, the holistic package of provisions currently in the Reconciliation Act will help us get there. But I think more important for policymakers, beyond all of these um, individual pieces of legislation, is that they just have to have courage to, to take this bold step. We are in a transformative moment in our nation's history. Um, we are in a difficult moment geopolitically. And um, I think there is broad agreement, as others have mentioned, among the American people about what needs to happen. Um, and change is really hard. 
um, it's understandable that um, this has been a difficult road. Um, but we have seen for so many reasons, whether it's climate emission or creating jobs across the country in diverse communities, ameliorating um, the worst effects of, you know, uh, traditional fuels um, or, um, you know, onshoring domestic manufacturing and reinvigorating that sector of our economy, um, or even freeing us from some of the geopolitical um, conflicts um, that have arisen because of our dependence upon um, foreign sources of energy. Um, we have to look, we have to work together on both sides of the aisle and agree that for the betterment of our country, we have to um, take this step forward. So I think the most important thing policymakers and their staffs can do is, is remember why you're there, why you're doing it, and to look within themselves and find that courage to really take those bold steps. Thanks, Erin. Mark? Yeah, I, um, I would say from my perspective, one of the real challenges that, that we see is, you know, I spent a lot of time talking about the need to retrofit buildings and accelerate the rate at which we uh, retrofit buildings much faster than, than what we're doing today, if we're going to achieve, at least within the building sector, the needed um, uh, carbon reductions in order to, to meet our climate goals. Uh, the, one of the challenges is that the deep energy retrofits that are required can be pretty disruptive and pretty expensive in terms of upfront costs. And it becomes, you know, frankly, for, for a lot of building owners, challenging to see uh, far enough into the future how this deep energy retrofit might actually enable a return on their investment, um, especially once we start getting into you know, the, the benefits of decarbonization. Again, the, the, the people that the building owners that are uh, that we're asking to do these retrofits have to see some kind of value at the end of the day. So what, you know, the, the things that I really think about are what, what can we do to help consumers and businesses uh, make it easier for them to actually pursue these deeper uh, energy efficiency and decarbonization retrofits. I think a lot of the uh, incentives that uh, Vincent would discuss are, are definitely a, a great way to help kind of take that initial uh, pain of a, of a higher efficiency product uh, and, and reduce it for, you know, for a uh, building owner. Um, and, and, and that can really help incentivize the right decision, if you will. Uh, another um, interesting tool that we didn't really spend any time talking about today, but is also uh, really has a lot of potential is uh, leveraging uh, public financing with private capital. That's enough, you know, that we have the ability to take, you know, a small amount of uh, public funding and then, you know, bring, you know, as the private sector, bring our own private financing into a project and we can quadruple the, 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 the overall impact of that uh, public financing that, that was, uh, you know, that might be granted to this overall uh, approach to addressing building retrofits. And so, um, you know, Th those types of things can really help bring down that upfront cost, really help uh, customers see the value of, uh, of retrofits. And then the other, the, the last thing that it can really also do, do is, is help unlock uh, as a service models like energy efficiency as a service or decarbonization as a service. So shameless plug over here, things that, uh, you know, again, are, are challenging to package and challenging to think about if, if you don't have the, if, if you don't, if as a building owner, you don't have the the you know ten year out uh, 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 patients to think through that, but being able to leverage all of these tools that the federal government can use to really help bring that down that initial pain and drive value out of these out of these uh, uh, building improvements that are going to be necessary, uh, you know we think can can really have a tremendous impact on overall emissions from the building sector. Thanks, Mark, um, Emily, and then Lisa. Love to hear any final thoughts uh, from the two of you. Thanks so much, and I'm, I see we're almost at time, so I'll be very brief. Um, Want to just uh, second the the points around energy efficiency, around Build Back Better version 2.0, whatever whatever we're going to call that. All of the tax incentives and and the package, um, you know, related to climate, I think is incredibly important and key to to all of this work. So the two things I'll mention, just not necessarily because they're the most important, but because we haven't mentioned them, are cybersecurity. 
uh, lots of great work going on in Congress around that and its importance. If you talk to utility CEOs, that's usually the number one thing that keeps them up at night. So we are certainly grateful for all the hard work that's going into that space um, and will become even more critical, I think, um, as the the, um, the the tragic um, uh, you know efforts in, in Ukraine are ongoing. Um, and then the other point I'll, I'll mention, it was in the slides, but we didn't talk about it necessarily in this discussion is EVs, right? Electric vehicles uh, are, are going to be critical to bringing down emissions. We see transportation continuing to be the number one emitting sector. Um, utilities see um, electric transportation as really key to helping us drive down emissions in that sector. Uh, and we will need the infrastructure, certainly at the distribution level, but also probably beyond that to, to, to make that happen. So EV tax credits are key to help drive down the costs and then ensuring that we are investing and in finding the siting and permitting solutions that Bill Harkin to, um, to make sure that the grid is, is resilient, reliable, and ready to, to meet those needs will also be very important. Well, this is Lisa. I'll just take a very brief opportunity to thank all the participants. Please think of us collectively and individually as resources for you. And you know, the number one priority of the council right now at the federal level is enactment of the climate and uh, energy related tax provisions uh, that passed the House and is being considered in the Senate. And we think, you know, as Aaron said, we got to seize the moment. We have a lot of challenges right now, but I think you've heard across the board that there's so many benefits to moving forward with the clean energy and energy efficient transition that's already underway. Um, and it will solve the problems we're discussing today and probably ones that we can't anticipate. So they're really, um, the investments are happening. They will help our economy grow and be competitive. We'll create jobs as we're also addressing pressing national security, energy security, um, and energy resilience concerns. So thank you so much to ESI, Dan, and I'll, I'll let you close. Well, thank you, Lisa. A um, couple quick things. Mark, you mentioned um, leveraging public-private partnerships. Um, we actually covered that a little bit a couple weeks ago in a briefing, and this is also a good moment to tease Vincent a little bit because he was a panelist on that briefing. Uh, he's, he's come back, but that was our um, uh, energy efficiency means business briefing from about a month ago. So if anyone in our audience wants to see or learn a little bit more about that opportunity as Mark described or Mark teed it up, it's one resource. Um, I think my answer to the question, it's kind of funny. I asked the question and apparently the answer is everything. Uh, our policy makers should be focused on everything. So hopefully for those in our audience, hopefully that's helpful. I think my answer would be, let's not lose sight of the programs we already have. We've talked to our panelists today, have talked a lot about, you know, recently enacted or perhaps soon to be enacted legislation. Um, but yesterday we just got a budget deal. Um, let's remember that there's great work already happening at DOE, HUD, USDA, EPA, across the federal government. There's lots of great programs delivering mitigation and adaptation benefits and resilience benefits every day. Let's stay focused on those as well and make sure that we're not losing any ground. Um, it's great to be excited about the new stuff and the big stuff and the shiny stuff, but the stuff that these agencies are doing every day is, uh, is really, really remarkable. So in the spirit of Emily mentioning something that hadn't already been mentioned, that's my answer. Um, unfortunately, uh, this is, uh, we have to wrap it up. Um, and I would like to uh, first of all, apologize for going three minutes over, but i um, like to start with a series of thank yous. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you uh, very much to our friends at the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, Lisa, Laura, Ruth, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for all your uh, help today. Also like to thank uh, everyone uh, with um, the House and Senate Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucuses. So thanks to Senator Reed, Senator Crapo, Senator Van Hollen, Senator Collins, and Representative Kind and all of their great staff uh, for helping us um, bring this briefing to our audience today. Um, our panelists, um, it's a great panel, Emily, Bill, Vincent, Aaron, Mark, uh, of course, Lisa. Um, I was gonna thank Lisa in a second for, for guiding the panel through the discussion, but really amazing panel. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'd also like to take a quick moment to thank everyone at EESI who helped bring um, the briefing to fruition today, thanks to Dan O. Um, there are two Dans, I'm Dan B, Dan O'Brien, Omri Laporte, uh, as well as Emma, Allison, Anna, Amber, Savannah, and we have two really wonderful interns this spring, Emily and Grace, and so thank you to them as well for helping do everything behind the scenes. Um, we're gonna put up a slide in just a moment. It's going to be a survey slide. Um, if you have a moment, please 
take two minutes out of your day and share with us your feedback for our briefing today. Um, there's also a link uh, to all of the materials, the webcast, and eventually written notes. Our summary notes will be available online. So anyone in our audience today who wants to go back and revisit any of the presentations we've heard, any of the, the slides, um, or um, you know, look up the fact book itself uh, at bcse.org, you can do all of that by visiting, by visiting uh, us online at www.eesi.org. Um, Mark said something along the lines of shameless plugs a couple minutes ago. Well, shameless plug time. We've got some really great briefings coming up in the next few weeks. We have climate adaptation programs across agencies on March 18th and building a durable national framework for large landscape conservation on March 29th. So please be sure to tune into those. Um, you can subscribe to our newsletter, uh, sign up for our briefings and read all of our great articles and other resources by visiting us online at www.esi.org. And with that, thanks to everyone uh, uh, on the panel today, including Lisa uh, and everyone at BCSE. And thanks to everyone in our online audience for joining us today. And I wish everyone a great rest of your Wednesday. Thanks so much.